Welcome to Future Talk. On today's program, we're going to talk about the globalization of technology, what that means to us, and how it's going to affect our lives. My guest is Richard Dasher, director of the U.S. Asia Technology Management Center at Stanford University and executive director of the Center for Integrated Systems, also at Stanford. In addition to his Stanford work, Dr. Dasher maintains an active consulting practice working with governments and private companies in the U.S. and Asia, advising them on technological trends and new business opportunities. He also speaks fluent Japanese and was the first non-Japanese person ever asked to join the senior governance of a major Japanese university when he was appointed to the board of directors of Tohoku University in 2004. He's also served as director of the U.S. State Department's training centers in Japan and Korea. Richard, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Marty. I'm looking forward to the talk this right. evening. So what exactly do we mean by globalization of technology? What does that phrase actually signify? Well, that's a great question. It means different things to different people. To me, what it really means is selecting the very best resources, business partners, and market opportunities on a worldwide scale so that the technology is one thing that you're looking at. If you open up an iPhone or you open up any kind of electronic device now, the parts of that device have traveled hundreds of thousands of miles and they were all selected because they were the best ones that the company wanted to put in the product. So nothing is totally made in the USA anymore. Everything has parts from all over the world. That's right. And a lot of things that look like they're coming from other places actually have things from the U.S. too. Now, are there any problems with globalization? Let's say you're depending on some country for your supplies and for some political reason or something else that stops uh, flowing. Well, globalization depends on open borders and open access. It also depends on cheap transportation. It also depends if you're in an economy that's expensive, like our economy is, it depends on having something that you bring that's valuable that other people can't really copy. Right, because in the United States, labor costs are fairly expensive compared to many places in Asia, for example. So if we globalize everything and capital always looks for the cheapest labor, is that going to cost us a lot of jobs here? Some jobs will naturally flow offshore. It can't be helped. But what you have to do if you're a government is to make sure that you have a good balance in your economy of different kinds of skills. That's not always a business solution. That's why the government really should pay attention to the labor market. But on the other hand, if you're in a place like Silicon Valley, we need to be doing things that are appropriate for a very expensive economy. And actually, innovation is one of the best things that you can use to keep a high standard of living in an economy. So do you mean that if you have more and better ideas than other people in other countries, that's what keeps you ahead? You're on the cutting edge? That's right. If you can standardize something, it will flow to a cheaper place. But you can't standardize innovation because the new ideas, every case is unique. It's different. And it also involves personal choices about taking risk. Those are areas where if you're in early, you see the new waves as they're beginning. You can do well. Silicon Valley has done well, despite the fact that there's really been a number of different waves in the history of the valley in which really our core industry has changed. Now the core industry is not really semiconductor manufacturing like it used to be. Well, what is the core industry here now? Somewhere in between social networks and big data. We're kind of in between two big waves, I think. Now, Silicon Valley has always been a leader of innovation. Is that because we did something right, or did it happen kind of accidentally? How do we know that it will continue to be the leader in that? Well, that's a great question. <laughs> you can always lose something, right? But I think that the system here grew up over 100 years. And what you have is a really good balance of top level people in different sectors coming to cooperate with each other. Innovation depends crucially on people having new ideas. New ideas are great to get at the boundaries between one field and another. That's why we have a lot of good science research going on here in various areas that will come out into new innovative products. 
it's the people who fund that, it's the people who are willing to take the risks of that, it's the people who are willing to go to work in a young, rapidly growing company that really make the Valley very strong. I don't see it changing anytime soon. But what I do see is Silicon Valley participating more in world markets. Every place like Silicon Valley that's an innovation center has to be supported by product sales in a much bigger market. That was the United States until about 1990, but Silicon Valley has really become part of the Pacific Rim since then. That's one reason I'm here. That's one reason I've been here at Stanford for 21 years now, is to help the students at Stanford and the Silicon Valley community know how to be more successful in Asia. Now, where did you get your background in Asia? Because you're not Japanese, but you're on the, or on the board of yeah. directors of a Japanese university. How did you get into that field? Well, it went way back to graduate school. I uh, started my PhDs in linguistics, and I studied Japanese because it was a non-European language that not many people had studied, and I wanted to be able to do analysis of that language because it had theoretical meaning. Then I decided I didn't want to be a college professor. So instead of going to work at a U.S. university as an assistant professor, I uh, went to work for the State Department. I wanted to do something practical, so I helped train the American diplomats that were assigned to the embassies and consulates in Japan and Korea. Uh, I did that for five years. Four years I was director of a field school out in Japan that was attached to the embassy in Tokyo. And at the end of that, I decided that I really better get some business experience. So I went to work in two Japanese companies doing international rights licensing. And it was wonderful um, experience. I got a lot of experience in three short years. And they were starting up this strange little technology management center in Stanford School of Engineering. I put in a couple of proposals for courses that I thought would be good to teach, and they hired me. Are there any cultural aspects that facilitate innovation? So, for example, is there anything different about Asian culture compared to American that creates a different environment for innovation? Well, I actually have to say that I think Silicon Valley is different from a lot of the rest of the United States. The rest of the United States, where you have older conservative traditions and less fluidity in the labor market, uh, it's very difficult to have the kind of robust innovation system that you get here. Japan is even more so. Because of labor shortages after World War II, the big companies in Japan started to offer these unwritten contracts for lifetime employment. It was never written into the contract, but it became the expectation. And that meant that the uh, best people would go to the big companies and they would stay there for their whole lives kind of like IBMers used to be here, big blue. In Silicon Valley, people jump jobs very quickly. It's rare to stay in any job for more than a few years. And there's a good and a difficult side to that. Part of it has to fit the person. The good side of it is you're always getting reallocation of economic resources. The best people will look for the best new projects and go to them, they will jump to them. The uh, bad side of it is you do get a lot of waste. You get a lot of uncertainty. It feels very uncertain to be a member of the Silicon Valley labor force. Now, does the globalization of technology tend to erode national boundaries? Does it tend to weaken forces of nationalism? 